Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, uh, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. And welcome to our day before Thanksgiving. It's true. Yeah. Um, not sure if this has anything to do with Thanksgiving, but that's okay. <laughs> We're here. Um, Encompass Live is the Nebraska Library Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. Generally speaking, if, you, if there's a holiday or something on a Wednesday, we do adjust things. That happens twice next month, and we'll show you that in our schedule. Um, both the live show and the archive recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So please do share um, with your colleagues, friends, family, neighbors, anyone who you think might be interested in any of the shows we have on Encompass Live. Um, we have a, a variety of things we do on the show. The, for those of you not from here in Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries in Nebraska. So we provide services, training, consulting, grants, um, education, resources, databases, all those things, to all types of libraries in the state. So public, K-12, academic universities, corrections, museums, um, historical sites, anything that has a library in it, that's who we're here for, and that's who we do shows for. So you will find things covering all sorts of anything, all sorts, all types of libraries in our upcoming shows in our archives. Uh, really, our only criteria that is something to do with library, um, li something libraries are doing, something we think they could be doing, uh, cool things libraries are doing that they we have them show off, come on the show and show off, uh, resources and tools that we think may be beneficial to them. Uh, we do bring in guest speakers sometime from um, all across the country to talk about from across Nebraska and across the country to talk about things they're doing at their libraries or share um, tips and tricks from them. Um, but we also have Nebraska Library Commission staff that come in and do things as well. And that's who we have today with me is Amanda Sweet, as you can see on the screen there. And she is our technology innovation librarian here at the Nebraska Library Commission. And this is our monthly Pretty Sweet Tech session with Amanda. She does this uh, once a month, usually the last Wednesday of the month, that's what we're trying to do. But scheduling things, sometimes it moves around. Stuff we're happens. trying to get, it happens, you know. you know, things have to be adjusted, but generally speaking, generally, oh, always once a month, she'll be on to talk just about something more tech related. Um, it'll definitely be, we sometimes have other sessions on that are tech things, but hers will always be something like that. Um, and today uh, we're going to talk about design thinking. How is technology made? There's lots of different ways I suppose it's made, but I'm, oh, about I a don't million. know. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so thank you everybody for being here with us on the day before Thanksgiving. And um, we'll see how we can make some technology, maybe for Thanksgiving. I don't know. I'm thinking about making food right now, what I need to do for tomorrow. You know, <laughs> That's what's on my mind, but. <laughs> you can actually design things your Thanksgiving. Oh, cool. All think right. about your audience. What are they allergic to? It's the same <laughs> process. Awesome. It's Absolutely. True. All right. So I will just hand it over to you, Amanda, to tell us how to do it. So design thinking, in a nutshell, basically just problem solving. It's another oh, yeah. flavor of it. So in this, we're going to kind of go over the most common diagram of how design thinking came about. And I'm going to choose a, an example that you will probably see on the desk in front of you. And it's easier to describe a new concept using an example that everyone is familiar with. Mm -hmm. So in this case, keyboard. Uh -huh. And then, so a lot of times tool thinking is People think about problem solving and design thinking to create new products and new technology. But you can also apply it to different processes. So I'll actually go over an example of how I use design thinking to choose the different technology tools, in this case, makerspace equipment for the library. Mm -hmm. And then we'll go over, if we have time, I'll go over the different technique, techniques and tricks to teach technology and design thinking in your library makerspace. Mm -hmm. And if we don't have time, I have a list of resources to go out. Oh, so either way, it'll be there. Wow, this mouse is kind of having problems. <laughs> 
So I chose this diagram for a reason. And it's because a lot of times right now, people put the problem before the problem solving process. Mm. They say, I want to build a robot, but they don't ask why. They don't ask who it's for, why they're building it. It's just and cool to have a robot, isn't it? <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> you know? That's not a good enough reason. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is, really. Mm -hmm. you know? But what are you going to do with it? It's true. But we're putting the why before the robot. So this model actually came out of Stanford. So the design thinking process came from about 25 plus years of research out of Stanford University. Cool because Stanford does like everything. <laughs> <laughs> so this is kind of their standard little honeycomb model. And you start with empathizing. And empathizing is basically just thinking about the user. Um, the most common way that I practically use it, in my, that I practically use design thinking in my day-to-day -day life is website design. Mm -hmm. Because, sure. so we have Nebraska libraries on the web. So a lot of the websites that belong to Nebraska libraries, they go through the Library Commission. Mm -hmm. And so part of what I do is to help people gather content and design, decide how that website's going to look. So we start out with people. Who goes to your library? Why? Mm -hmm. So here, our keyboard example. Not everyone builds websites, so I don't actually recommend using that example to start people out in design thinking. So if you are planning on implementing design thinking teaching in your library, start with keyboards. Because mm -hmm. if you look down, everyone knows what a keyboard is. Mm -hmm. And now, who uses a keyboard? Everybody. Everyone. But wait. Blind, visually impaired don't always use a keyboard in the same way. Mm -mm. And they sometimes use braille displays instead of keyboards. So if you're going to design a keyboard for a special user group, you would do it in a different way. And you might also use different function keys. Are they going to be using this keyboard for audio equipment? Mm -hmm. Are you going to need to integrate it with speakers? Do you need to integrate it with different devices? Is this someone who's going to be designing a keyboard that'll be controlling a robot? In what environment is this keyboard going to be used in? And then you start listing different things, different reasons people are going to be using this. Mm -hmm. These are the most generic ones. But then mm -hmm. you start digging a little deeper into what I just talked about, mm -hmm. and you start thinking about it in a different way. And then you can start thinking about so many different options that it just almost becomes paralyzing. <laughs> you know? Well, that's not good. You're not going to get anywhere. <laughs> you know? So that's why you have to narrow down your focus. And that's why the next step is actually labeling and defining your users and what they are going to be using it for. So in this case, I just chose a few different key reasons that people would be using it. So when people want to choose a keyboard, they choose the pressure of your finger against the key. Are you going to wear your fingers out over time? Is the angle of the keyboard comfortable for you? On the back of the keyboard, a lot of them have these little, little tabs under here. Mm -hmm. And they didn't always used to have that. It used to be permanently tilted up. At okay, whatever angle it yeah. came as, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I did that when I was looking, when we were looking to buy new keyboards for home, I mean, yeah. um, for gaming, for me. Um, actually, and it, I tested out different keyboards, like, and they have them on display, like in the stores. Tested yeah. the different keys to see how hard they were to just to press down. Yep. Um, and different people, my husband and I, we have different opinions on that too. Yeah. I like it easier and lighter, and he likes to have it, it more resistance. Yeah. And some people have two mm. keyboards at their station now, just because of that. For using it for different yeah. reasons. Yeah. Oh, wow. We haven't gone that far. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I totally did. <laughs> uh, we have one wired keyboard, and then we have one USB keyboard, and then we just toggle between the two. Uh -huh. And then how is your keyboard going to be connected? And how are you, do you label the keys on the keyboard so people understand what the button actually does? 
when they started adding that little FN button on some of the keyboard, mm -hmm. the function key. Yeah. Not everyone knew what it actually what they were did. supposed to do with it, yeah. So they would start, originally on a keyboard, you would have a button that just had that volume thing. You would just press the volume button, and your speaker volume would go up or down. And then they readjusted the way they format the keyboard, and then you had to press and hold down the FN key and press and hold down that mm -hmm. button. The people didn't know. Who's going to, yeah, these people know. So people were returning keyboards because they didn't, it didn't know work. what that was. And they were like, well, this just isn't working. Like, it's, this is a problem. But it was actually a problem with the instructions and the mm -hmm. way they displayed it. The only way that they described what that function key did was in a tiny little brochure. <laughs> The, the user manual that no one ever reads on a keyboard mm. because everyone knows what a keyboard is. Not when you change things. Yeah, yeah. But when you reformat it, when you adjust the design, people need to know how to use it. Mm -hmm. So that is part of that user design. You're designing a product, but how are you going to communicate to people what the different new features are for? You know people need it. You know people want to use those function keys to turn volume up and down. People are doing it. What is it? So now, how are you actually going to design this thing? Most technology isn't actually coming out of thin air. It's, most technology is adapted from other technology. Mm -hmm. In this case, we have an electric typewriter, yep. a QWERTY keyboard. We have our layout already set up. So now on the right-hand side, we have the IBM keyboard. That's one of the first keyboards that was ever made. Mm -hmm. They just copied Depend, the yeah. typewriter. Yeah. yeah. And so now you can see that if you saw a profile image of this, you would see that it's actually angled up. And there are no adjustment tabs on the back of this It looks thing. like it's kind of a, yeah. yeah. And they mm -hmm. mimic the swoop of some of the original typewriters and the angle of them. But then over time, they started testing this stuff out and they started thinking of different ways that you can make it. So this is the ideation phase. There's no one way to make a keyboard. So to ideate something, you can sketch it, um, you can build something out of clay, you can use Play-Doh, mm -hmm. you can use... Model it. Yeah, like through the model. And a lot of people actually just use cardboard. There's yeah, a reason sure. cardboard is popular. And it's easy, it's lightweight, you can cut yeah. it up into all sorts of different shapes yeah. and things you want, yeah. And when you're testing designs, if you just want to know if the pressure against a key is going to work, do you necessarily need the keyboard to work? No. Oh, to actually do something? Yeah, no. Yeah. And if you want to test, like there are certain features that you can test out that you don't need a fully functioning product mm -hmm. to be able to do. And if you just want to see if it's aesthetically pleasing, it doesn't take much. Mm -hmm. And just make it cheap. So now you're on to the prototyping and testing. You can choose one of the different ways that you want to solve this problem and then make it. So now on the left-hand side, we have everything that came in our uh, when we were initially designing it, when we are defining the problem. Mm. So you see that I have two things that are crossed out, comfortable and does it work well in the environment. And it's because when we do the testing on this particular brand of keyboard, it didn't pass that test. Mm. So this is where you're gathering user feedback. When you, I chose this picture because you can look at the angle of her hands when she's trying to type on this keyboard. <laughs> that looks, yeah. That yeah. bent wrist does not look comfortable at all. No, and the left. It's the width of the keyboard. Mm. If you look at the person's shoulders and then look at the width of the keyboard, you can see why she has to do that. So then you start looking at ergonomics. Is it comfortable? Mm. What's the angle of the wrist? So then you start looking at other designs. And we have the ergonomic keyboard. That's, yes, my mom has one of those. I have one upstairs, and too. <laughs> you got to get used to it. Even though it's ergonomic, it has to be best for resting your hands. Yeah. Wait, same thing you're saying about not knowing how to use the function key. Not get, it's hard to get used to. Yeah. Whenever I yeah. go to her house to use her computer, I'm like, duh, I have to put my hands in a different place. Yeah. 
Yeah, I tested but within a day I get it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But then if you look at the wave on this model and mm -hmm. you see that it's the right hand side is more straight on, but on the curve on the left hand side you can see that the the wrist would be able to angle outward. Mm -hmm. And you compare it to the angle Where of the your hands, hands are here. gonna not have to be yeah. bent in a weird way. Yeah. So they changed the keyboard so you don't have to adjust your hands. And that's why ergonomic keyboards, if they're designed well and designed for a particular width of shoulder, mm -hmm. it works. Mm -hmm. But then what if it's the environment? What do you do about that? You add a tray. Mm -hmm. so that might be better, yeah. yeah. You need your arms lower or whatever, yeah. So this is the quote-unquote innovation. <laughs> we started out designing a keyboard. But we found out that no matter what keyboard design we thought of, the desk is still the it's same height. We just needed to change the desk, actually. Yeah. It wasn't a keyboard problem. <laughs> yeah. So this is where we're encouraging people to think outside the box here. And this mm -hmm. is actually the best way that I found to teach design thinking, is you don't necessarily have to have someone just automatically come up with something completely from scratch. If you want to teach design thinking as a concept, don't use robotics. <laughs> if, unless they already know robotics. If they've already been building robots for your ever in a day, go ahead. But if you just want to teach a new problem solving method, use something that people are know, that people know. It's easier to wrap your head around and you're mm -hmm. not increasing that learning curve by about 20 of a million times. So then once you get used to the idea of looking at existing technology and thinking about how is this stuff made and how did they adjust the design over time to go through this process? How did they meet the needs of the user and how did they adjust this design and put the user first? And then you start moving into more unfamiliar territory. So this is where, I'm sure some of you have probably heard of user experience design oh, yeah. already. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, I have. Yeah. A lot in, I mean, what you mentioned being in website design. You really oh, need yeah. to do, people are, have done so many drastic new iterations of websites, and you really do need to have someone come and see, is this really going to yeah. get people where they need to go on your website? Yeah. Do they understand where everything is? Can they find things? Yeah. Yeah. So you're going to find a lot of design thinking techniques overlap with user experience design techniques. Mm. And they're both different flavors of problem solving. If you've designed lesson plans yourself and you are yourself a teacher, mm. you'll probably see it in the ADDI model. The ADDI model is kind of a way to break down the process and find out what you actually want to teach, who's going to be learning, and look at put the learner first and then make sure that your teaching is fitting that process. So you'll find a lot of overlap with it. Hmm. And if you teach um, if you teach like STEM concepts and you try to teach these new techniques to students, you want to find out what their original comfort level is. If you want to teach a circuit to a group of students, and you find out that those students have already been working with Raspberry Pi for five years, and you try to introduce paper circuits, they're going to look at you funny. <laughs> <laughs> but if you find out that the opposite is true, that you try to bring in Raspberry Pi because it was really cool and popular, and then you find out that they don't know what a circuit is, mm -hmm. and they've never seen, of course they've seen electricity before. <laughs> I mean, switch on, switch off. But that's different but, than knowing yeah. how the circuit works. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So if you choose that tool and try to implement it and you don't know the your user's comfort level and experience with technology, it's like an auto fail. Mm -hmm. And so that is why I started applying it to makerspace design. So this is a soldering station. And I'll tell you a fun fact about how this kind of went hay like haywire in our own makerspaces. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Because, so when we first started out, and this was actually shortly before I started in this technology job now, mm -hmm. they were picking out all these different kits. And then mm -hmm. someone said, oh my God, you really need to get an Arduino. And like, if you're going to get an Arduino, you need a soldering station. 
So they bought this stuff and they just got like, they got four of each different kit. And then I started on and I was like, why in the world do we have a soldering kit? <laughs> because all the, the Arduino boards, it, they're just plug and play wires. So then I started having to teach this class and I would show them how to put together a circuit and then I would show them how the Arduino board works. Mm -hmm. And then I would say, oh, but we have this soldering kit too, but you can't use it because we can't solder with this board. Well, okay. Yeah. Who told who told who to get soldering station then? How did someone, someone, demand, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody wasn't really paying, didn't yeah. know what they were recommending. So, okay. But they didn't use design thinking to choose it. Mm. They didn't say, what are we going to be using this for? What is the experience level of the people that we're going mm -hmm. to be sending this over to? Because right now the Arduino was one of our least used kits. Yeah. So now instead of Arduino, I recommend paper circuits to a lot of people because it's easier mm -hmm. to implement. It engages the comfort level of the librarians and that it mm -hmm. also engages the comfort level and experience level of the different patrons. Mm -hmm. And had we done that initial planning, we wouldn't have chosen that. We would have mm -hmm. chosen something like little bits that uses a magnetic oh, yeah. circuit. And it's way easier to put together and it still teaches the same skills. Mm -hmm. But it's also, it fits the user. By the mm -hmm. way, I got little bits. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> it's not a product placement. I just like them. <laughs> no, they're good. Lots of libraries are using them. I yeah. know. Yeah. So how do we actually do it? So I put together, this is something that I put together as I was choosing makerspace equipment over the years. And you'll have access to this link if you download this. Mm -hmm. how yes, this after, and, uh, yeah, I'll mention that too so people know. Um, um, I mentioned at the beginning that we do, we are recording the show and we will be archiving this. And along with it will be a link to um, this presentation um, on Google, which you will have links to everything that Amanda's put together for you there. So you have all that afterwards. So we're about to go over an example of this, but you don't have to jot down or memorize all the different steps in here. No, you'll have this. Afterwards. Because, it, yeah, I wrote this out because. One, it helps me, and two, it mm -hmm. helps the other the librarians that have been trying to choose makerspace equipment. Right. So this will go over some basic different questions that I ask myself when I try to suit equipment to a particular community. And one that I just recently added is, are there other organizations in the area that are using similar equipment? Uh -huh. Because we've had libraries that bought like a set of equipment and then three months into it, they find out no one showed up because a local high school was also doing it. Oh, already had it. Oh, yeah. okay. So they were trying to target teens and bring in teens, but it didn't work. Partnerships with them is a better yeah. way to go find yeah. out what are the, what else, what are other places using and then reach out to them to do something together, do a joint event oh, yeah. or a joint program yeah. of some sort. Yeah. yeah. And then you can fill in resources, and then you get double the bang for your buck. Mm -hmm. And then, so let's go in here and actually run through this example. I just wanted to let you know that was there. So we're going to start out by and full screen. So a lot of people are building maker spaces for kids, but some are actually also building for adults. Oh yeah. So and some are building for both. So mm -hmm. you might might want to choose a tool that works for both adults and kids, mm -hmm. and can grow as the skills grow. So this is why you want to find out what the goals of your makers are. What do people want to get out of it? Mm -hmm. And when you know what people want to get out of it, what kind of skills they want to learn, what professions they're already in, what professions they want to start getting into, what kids want to learn about, you start getting a whole lot better idea of what technology tools and makerspace equipment will actually help. And then once you have a list of goals that people want to accomplish for themselves and you find enough overlapping goals in your own audience, you know what will actually add value to individuals and add value to your community. And you know that because these people were part of this planning process and they were asked for feedback, mm -hmm. they're way more likely to come in. Oh, sure. 
Now, what about though, especially talking with makerspaces, I know we've had this question and people have trouble with this. People in your community might not even know what can be done with this with the equipment, so they don't know what they want to accomplish yet. Yeah. It's like yeah. I don't know what I can do because I don't know that the thing, it even that there's even a yeah. piece of equipment that I can use that I didn't know there was something I can use to make customized coasters to give out at yeah. Christmas or for the holidays. You know, they aren't even thinking of that. I mean, is, I guess examples of here's well, some ideas because some I mean they feel like maybe oh yeah makerspace big buzzword let's get a 3d printer okay sure but there's more to it than that there's other things yeah. you can do but what if they don't even know what they want what they could accomplish with it so the thing is that you're not necessarily selling a product that the equipment can make okay because so for example through with our stuff the library innovation studios we have mm -hmm. the laser cutters yes and most people use it to make Christmas ornaments, which is awesome. Oh, sure. But another thing that we want to look at is, do people need that? <laughs> and is it worth getting a $12,000 laser cutter so people can make ornaments? Mm -hmm. Is that adding value to the community? Is it adding value to the people who are making it? Is it, is it, is it sustainable for the people that are making these Christmas ornaments? If the laser cutter in the library breaks, their business is gone. Mm -hmm. If they have someone else who signed up and the laser cutter isn't available, but they have an order due, their business mm -hmm. is gone. So is this mm -hmm. sustainable? And if you want to encourage entrepreneurship through your library, it's not the best way to do it. Is that the piece of equipment to buy? No. So we don't actually mm -hmm. want to show people different examples of stuff that you can make you want to show people how to build a market. Mm -hmm. You want to show people, is there value in the stuff that I'm making? And a makerspace isn't just the direct output of stuff that you can make. It's the skills that you can make. So what are you learning if you start using a laser cutter, if you start cutting out different shapes and trying to fit them together to build 3D objects? What are you doing if you try to cut out different laser cutter objects and start prototyping for a larger concept? Mm -hmm. It's not just about the end end product, it's also about the process. Yes. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so with all these different tools, what do people want to learn about technology itself? Mm -hmm. So if we are choosing a, so say the example that we're gonna use in here is robotics. So who cares? Mm -hmm. If you can't find a reason yourself to, to state why this technology matters, you're not going to be able to market it very well. You're not going to sell it very well. And if you can't sell the library service and you can't sell the technology, it's going to be doubly difficult to get people to come in to use it. And if you are introducing technology concepts and you want to show people what artificial intelligence is or you want to show people what Internet of Things or big data is, you want to find how you can market that and you want to find out if your community is interested in that. Should they be interested? In my opinion, oh my gosh, mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> the world is, is, the, is the, yeah. I was going to say changing. It is this now. Technology yeah. is out there and people yeah. at all levels and all areas. Farmers are using Wi-Fi to figure out their farming, what's going on in this field and that field, and drones. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. So introducing this stuff to your community is amazing. But people mm -hmm. won't use it if you can't sell it. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know why people would be interested in these technology concepts, they won't go. So this is why... These are some of the main reasons that I found that people want to start learning this. And now the one on the bottom is the one that I want to zero in on here. The coding. Learn coding basics. Mm -hmm. It's the most generic example that you could ever possibly hear of because coding can go in so many different directions. And people, most people aren't going to design all technology from scratch and use it from scratch. Not to be confused with Scratch, <laughs> which <laughs> is a dragon to, to learn yeah. coding, yes. <laughs> but most people are just going to leverage technology. They want to learn how to use technology and adapt it to suit their needs, just mm -hmm. like we saw with the keyboard design. 
So this is one of the goals that we want to find out mm -hmm. is are people actually interested in coding concepts or are they interested in learning about enough about coding to adapt technology to suit their needs? Mm -hmm. And the level that people want to engage with this technology is going to influence the type of technology that you choose. Mm -hmm. And coding is also another one of those buzzwords of uh, they're telling people, you know, kids, all kids, all kids have to learn it because that's, the, yeah, <laughs> that's the future. If you're going to get a job at all, it's like, well, no, um, that's not the only thing to do in your, in your life. No. But um, it's nice to know about it, yeah. And so they did a Quora survey, and it's up to you whether you want to use Quora as a real scientific evidence or not. But so they found out that they did a mass survey, and they found out that all these people were signing up for boot camps, coding boot camps. 67% uh -huh. dropped out. Ugh. And so people mm -hmm. are interested in learning coding, but why? Yeah, they, once again, they don't yeah. know why, they, why yeah. they're there. Do they want to earn more money? Do they want to solve a specific problem? Do they are they just curious because it's yeah. all being talked about? Yeah. Yeah. Did someone tell them you need to learn coding and then they go, fine? <laughs> you know? you know? I guess I have you know? to. <laughs> That's no way to learn. Right? Yeah. And then people, not surprisingly, people don't do it. So what does this mean about actually choosing stuff? Once you know this stuff, how do you apply it to what you're doing? So in the case of robotics, because this is the number one question that I get, like it actually really is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so most of the people out there, they want beginner to intermediate level tools. And then mm -hmm. they want resources to extend those tools out if they are interested in going into a multi-facet, like into a more specific facet. So what I did for the Makerspace tools that I chose was to find stuff that already had pre-made curriculum designed for kids because there are about mm -hmm. a billion and one different things. Oh, yeah. And I didn't want to put you my time to reinvent it. it. No, yeah. you don't need to reinvent the wheel in this case. There's so much out there, yeah. So I chose stuff that already had good resources. And then I started adapting it for adults. So I'll give you an example. The Q Make Wonder, I know you just saw, I have like yes, a I wall just saw. of these. <laughs> yeah. There's like, what, 20 of them? Yeah, yeah. And they're all these like little just look the triangular them. things in their boxes, and they're all looking at you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, he's got a little smile on his face, yeah. but still. Slightly so, creepy, but it's true. <laughs> so the way that I adapted this to get adults thinking about this is this Make Wonder robot, the Q, is implemented using artificial intelligence. And it uses this in a few different ways. So it uses a rule-based chatbot. And this mm -hmm. chatbot is designed to teach coding through story. Mm -hmm. okay. And so you can choose an avatar, and this assigns a personality to the robot. I found mm -hmm. one, like, incredibly annoying personality. <laughs> like, it is the most peppy robot that is <laughs> always cheery. Way too happy. Yeah. <laughs> there is such a thing as being way too happy with yeah. your life. <laughs> and I was just like, no. <laughs> you know? But then I looked at that. Like, I had this visceral reaction to a robot. Personality, and then, yeah. yeah. And then I asked myself, what is the lesson here? <laughs> we are giving robots personality. Mm -hmm. We're personifying them. When I started looking at these robots, people interacted with these robots differently. Mm -hmm. They actually had a mini conversation with the robot. And then if I compared it to that UB Tech or the Lego Mindstorm, there are no overt human qualities to the design mm -hmm. of those two bottom robots. And there are you sort of see like a little set of eyes in the Lego Mindstorm, but it's more of like a cute quali kind of thing instead of an actual personality. Well, the dash and dot one, it looks like a one eyeball thing, like a, yeah. like a one yeah. eye. Yeah. And those are but, actually made by the same company, too. So the dash and dot is for a lower oh, age group than the Make Wonder. The, uh, the Q yeah. is designed for teens, and dash and dot is designed for like yeah. kindergarten yeah. through sixth grade. Right. But how is adding a personality and adding human traits, personifying robots, going to change the way people receive technology? 
depends on if it annoys them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, it could be a bad thing. But, but making it more personal, comfort potentially. Yeah. And what about a chat bot infused with a robot with a personality? Mm. And this robot is now designed to basically have a conversation with you. And they're getting better at chatbots too. Mm -hmm. So if you personify a robot, people have a human visceral reaction to the personality that's programmed into this robot. Mm -hmm. How does this impact the way we're taking technology? It's a good question. Yeah. It's like the, you know, Siri or the Google Assistant, the Google Home thing, yeah. um, having conversations with them. I've done it. We have, yes. We, <laughs> yeah. have, we have the Google one that are at home, and sometimes <laughs> get annoyed at her. Yeah. Um, she doesn't answer the question the way you want to, yeah. or yeah. You, you say, look up, hey, Google, can you tell me blah, 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 and she looks up the completely wrong thing, and you're like, where did, yeah. They've also started adding things I know I've noticed in the Google one. Um, all I can describe it as encouraging good behavior. Yeah. Like when you say things to it, like to set a timer for cooking something or add something to the grocery list. If you say please, she will do a little ding. Thank you so much for asking so nicely. Yeah. Timer set for 10 minutes. And I'm like, where did, you're welcome. Um, I mean, <laughs> I tested that out with the Google Home set that I got too. Mm -hmm. So I got like a Google Home, it's the one with the display on it. Ah, see, we just have the little yeah. mini. Mm -hmm. So, I wanted to test that politeness thing, uh -huh. so I started swearing at it. <gasps> and <laughs> did it not like it? Did you get scolded? It refused to respond. Oh. Like, it refused to acknowledge my. I have, request. We have not gone that bad, that yeah. far with it. We said things like, "I didn't like that." Oh, yeah. I'm so sorry. I'll try better next time. Yeah. Great. I guilt tripped. They guilt tripped me. <laughs> yeah. And it doesn't so. do the thing every time, too. Sometimes you say please, and it doesn't no. always say. No, it's, yeah. Yeah. It switches it up a little. But yes, yeah, we have conversations with her or with each other, my husband, about, did you hear what she just said to me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, no, she did not. She doesn't yeah. like me as much as she likes you. She, yeah. yeah that. But it's changing. So this is mm -hmm. what we But how does that teach you? I don't know what it's teaching us at home. But yeah. <laughs> um, so this is actually most the most important part we can do about this is open up the conversation mm -hmm. and get people actually thinking about it. Because on one hand, this robot now has a personality, but it also has sensors. Hmm. These sensors take in the world around it. And if you start infusing it with the power of the Internet of Things and the power of the sensors that Google Home uses, this robot knows a lot about you. Oh, yeah. It collects your health information. It collects information about um, the environment around you, the temperature, humidity. It, can, it collects a whole lot of stuff. Um, Google Home knows when you're not home. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a thermostat that is operated by Google Home, it's really easy to look at the data and to know that when your temperature is automatically going lower, you are likely not on the premises. Mm -hmm. And if it's pre-programmed to be going low, long, to be at a low temperature for multiple days in a row, you're probably on vacation. Because you don't need to turn it up. Yeah. And now. Technology has a greater influence over us. Mm -hmm. So now this is the lesson that we want adults to start thinking about. What does this mean for them personally? How does all this information that's being collected, what if it gets in the wrong hands? And are we trusting this little robot and trusting this technology because it has a personality? And are mm -hmm. we trusting it? Should we? Mm -hmm. And they're concerned a lot of people have the privacy and what data is it gathering. Yeah. And like you said, if it knows that you're not there for multiple days, can some bad person hack into that and know you're not yeah. home and then your house gets broken into, et cetera, yeah. et cetera, yeah. And when you're interacting with Google Home, you don't necessarily think about the privacy policy because they mimic a regular conversation. Yeah. When you're having a regular conversation, you don't think about this context of technology and computers. Mm -hmm. We're teaching digital literacy concepts, we're teaching privacy and security. That's in this laptop. 
-hmm. If you're not looking at that box, if you're not having that memory trigger that says, oh, I'm working on a computer right now, I need to think about privacy and security, you don't think about that when you're just having a conversation. You don't have that memory trigger that says, no, I need to think about this. I'm just yelling something into the living room to tell yeah. the Google to do something for yeah. me, to look something up, to add something to the list, to set a timer, to check on that, yeah. And we don't, when we're listening to information just through, like we're just listening to it, we're not seeing it, we don't have that visual cue, we don't always double check our information mm -hmm. the same way. It's just mm -hmm. a person who answered our question. And we don't ask, where did this result come from? So when you start having people interact with this robot and start having people interact with Google Home, start asking them, do you ever think about where that information came from? And how is this algorithm choosing what information to pull up? Do you know? Mm -hmm. So that is how you get that Q robot, which is a relatively low investment, mm -hmm. and extend it outward and you can start reframing it towards adults, even though it was already just geared toward kids. And it was when you start getting adults thinking about these questions that they never even knew they should be worried about, mm -hmm. that's when you start bringing people back in. And that's when you can start with the robot and then move out into Google Home. And then that's how, if you remember the example I used earlier, that's how we paired the sensors from Google Home into the robot because robots can use all the same sensors that are used in Internet of Things. So this is starting to use these low-cost tools to put it into a wider context. And so going back to original design thinking question, who is it for? What did you mm -hmm. choose? And another big thing is how much time do you have for a lesson plan? And so that Arduino Uno on the left, it can do a whole ton of stuff, but it also takes longer to build that basic skill set to get up to where you need to go. Now, do some of these will come with curriculum? Yeah. yeah. And not, not all different. curriculum was developed equally. <laughs> yeah. But it's a thing. <laughs> anyway, so I just chose the top three just because I was able to expand them out more. The mm -hmm. Lego Mindstorm actually was, I almost chose Lego Mindstorm instead of Vex Robotics, mm -hmm. but I only chose Vex Robotics because they use different design thinking elements in there, mm -hmm. and they start encouraging people to think about design. So if, you, if there are adults or high schoolers that want to extend out and start getting into engineering and start implementing robotics in their real world and in their business, they might want to start looking at that level of depth that Vex Robotics or Mindstorms goes into. Mm -hmm. And Q can also use JavaScript. Mm -hmm. And Vex Robotics also uses C plus, I think it's C, it's either C plus plus or C sharp. It was C plus plus would make more sense because it was one of the original robotics languages. Mm -hmm. But it allows you to get into like that real world application. And then you try it out. Mm -hmm. So right now, this is all theory. You don't know until this stuff, after you've done it and gathered mm -hmm. feedback, whether this all actually works. So this is going to be a big project. You buy one yeah. and test it before you decide we're going to have five of these to have yeah. programs or multiple classes. And stuff. Yeah. yeah. And so then gathering feedback is one of the most important parts in here. Because when you are trying to figure out your audience and figure out what you want to accomplish, you want to figure out really specific target goals for these objects. And then you want to ask the right questions during your feedback to find out if it is meeting the goal. And if people in the long term were able to accomplish these tasks. And if these tools were either too easy or too difficult to get them into where they want to go. And there is no one-stop shop, sh like shopping list for these tools because everyone in the community is at different experience levels. Mm -hmm. So some people that want really hardcore learning environments, they might want to invest in 
themselves. But if you're exposing people to new technology concepts, then the library is a good place to go to just learn the initial concept, find out, experiment with it, find out what you're interested in, how you want to frame it yourself, and then you encourage self-learning so that that user can go through and branch off from the tools in the library and shift over to their own personal interest. So you're also helping users so that they don't waste their own money too. Mm -hmm. And what time are we at? Um, 10.49. Cool. So that's plenty of time. Okay. And then you also want to make sure that you can sell this to the people that are funding the library. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> so it's great if this all ties into what, learn what people in the library are trying to learn. Does it fit your library's mission? Lifelong learning is the mission of a whole lot of different libraries. Oh, yeah. But does technology actually come top on the list? But what the does library? that mean in your library? Yeah. I mean, that's the big phrase that a lot of people are using. It is very important for everyone. But yeah. what does that mean in your community? Yeah. Yeah. And if you can't sell this to the people that are funding the library, then you probably won't get very far with it. So it's kind of... Are you able to, one, either change your library's policies to start incorporating this brand of lifelong learning, or two, can you sell it and can you shape it so that it fits your existing policy? Mm -hmm. And that will depend on the type of library that you're in. If you're a school library, this would be a whole lot easier because sure. it already automatically narrows down your audience. Yeah, and your curriculum and is there yeah. Yeah, that you need to yeah. work this into, yeah. So it's, if you're a school librarian, that'll be a whole lot easier already. But if you're a public librarian that's either working with schools or going rogue, <laughs> then there might be a little bit more of a selling point there. Go rogue, yeah. right? We encourage that. Right. And sometimes it just doesn't work out. Mm -hmm. So having an understanding board is a wonderful thing. Because this is all new to everybody. Mm -hmm. I mean, makerspaces, technology tools, and this brand of lifelong learning is different. Design thinking is a different concept that, so that people have not used a whole lot so far. So it's kind of like you're trying something different. You're just learning how to sell it. You're just learning how to use it. It might take a few rounds. Like... I failed colossally when I first tried this. <laughs> like, it was, no. <laughs> Bad choices were made. Yeah. yeah. Luckily, in that case, I didn't actually waste a ton of money. It was just like a teaching method that mm -hmm. I did. But it just, what I, the problem that I had was I started going too deep in depth into the tech tools when, so I was going up here and people had never heard of it before. Yeah. So I was trying to get people up to a different level quicker than they were willing or able to go. Yeah, that's a big and, jump. Yeah. Part of it was a time constraint because I had hour blocks of time to be able to teach it. Mm -hmm. And part of it was that I didn't have, I wouldn't have repeated interaction with the same groups in the way that would help implement these more complex technology concepts. Building on your previous. Yes. Yeah. And so I just tried to push in too much technology concept in one spot. So that is one thing that it actually is pretty common mistake. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> so try again. But failure is okay. That's something that's hard for some people and some boards or city councils, whatever, to understand mm -hmm. that not everything is going to be a success and that's okay. Yeah. You do, failure is something to learn by yeah. and go and try something else. Just because it didn't work doesn't mean it wasn't a good thing to do. Just maybe the way you did it or the tool you used wasn't the right tool. Yeah. Find the, the right one. You can see there's so many different types of robots, yeah. robotic um, kits you can get. There's going to be something, yeah. Yeah, like I train people using Lego Mindstorm, but I mm -hmm. shifted over to the queue just because people didn't have the time to build that robot from scratch in the time that they had available. Mm. There, I'm learning. <laughs> <laughs> but pretty much, 
this is my kind of rule of thumb for everything. Mm -hmm. If you can make it, you can design think it. And I thought the book was, yeah. was a nice touch. <laughs> <laughs> so now we can dive into a little bit more of the unfamiliar here. So this is what I put together for websites. So this goes for the exact same stuff that we just did for choosing makerspace equipment. Mm -hmm. But this is for designing the outward facing site that people are actually going to see. And it's the same exact thing, but just applied in a different way. So you start by asking yourself, who actually goes to your library? And why? And once you have these questions in the empathy section kind of narrowed down, you kind of take note of that and find out who you want to target, who's already going, are you already meeting the mission of your library. And this website is also going to be used not just by patrons, but to show the value of your library to the community members, to the public, and to the people that are going to be funding the library. And then start building off of what you just collected. So this will run you through prioritizing what you do and do not need immediately on your website. And then it'll dive into, so this is one, two, three, four. These numbers correspond with the numbers that are up here. Hmm. So it will mirror the information that you collected in the empathy section and say, well, okay, what do you do with that in your defining section? And then it goes into different things, that, different ways that you can translate that information you collected into your actual design. And then you start thinking about how this design will actually look. And you start think about, thinking about, oh, I skipped one. So you're, oh, my ID8 is here. <laughs> so then you start thinking about the different ways that you can actually design this system. And what is this actually going to look like? And once you know more or less what it's going to look like, build it. So for a WordPress website, you can choose a theme because a WordPress theme is already pre-made and laid out for you. And so when you choose a theme that you like, then you can build a home page and then you can build a one single content page and just find out if it looks the way that you want. Yeah. You're not putting a lot of time, energy, or effort into building the whole full thing up front. Test it out on a smaller, yeah, yeah something smaller. You don't even need real content for that one, just to see if you like it. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lorem ipsum is a yeah. that you just if it's, it's basically a site that you can go to, you copy out just the amount of text that you need, and it's just filler text, just to see if it looks the way you want. And if you are designing it from scratch, if you're doing if you're doing like HTML, CSS, or you will have like some other framework that you already use then don't actually launch straight into that framework. Instead, start building it in Google Slides or start building and designing the layout in PowerPoint or like a GIMP is like a free mm -hmm. design. Start building it in there and make sure that just the layout looks the way that you want it to look. It doesn't have to be interactive. It doesn't have to be functional. It doesn't have to do anything or be anything. But does it look and does it function the way that you, or does it look and does it do what you want? Mm -hmm. So then once you have that layout together, it's and kind of like cardboard for websites, basically. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and oh, and Google Sites is free. So Google Sites, you don't have mm -hmm. to do anything with it. You just play around with it. But there's also a learning curve to using Google Sites. So if you have never done anything with websites, I would recommend just doing the generic design in Microsoft Word or GIMP or anything you're familiar with. And then once you have it looking the way you want, 
you then when you actually test it out the whole thing and put it together with the layout colors, choose your font size and all that fun stuff, all that fun stuff. Mm -hmm. And then you get feedback. And that's when you get the feedback from people, find out how long people are actually engaging with different parts of your site and if people are using the site as intended and how people actually are using it. Your usability testing is yeah. very important. Yeah. You may think you know where where you want people to go and where things should be and, and you have some great ideas and you know it yeah. needs to be on there, but until other people and a, a bunch of people actually use it, you don't realize where they're really looking or yeah. what they're really clicking on. And you may have to step back and say, oh, I was wrong. And that's okay. And yeah. admitting your mistakes is awesome. Banana peel. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. then you just do it based on what people are actually doing. Yeah. yeah. Usability testing is very, very important. So, and this is based, I just kind of whipped through this because it's just another example of how design thinking can be used. Mm -hmm. If you do actually happen to need to build a website, feel free to help. click through yeah. this link and you can work through it. Does anybody have any questions or comments or thoughts? Um, please do share um, about anything that Amanda's talked about in the go in the questions section of your GoToWebinar interface. Or raise your hand and you can um, ask your question that way. Okay. So now, where else can you go to learn more about this stuff? So if you want to learn about design thinking itself, how it relates to libraries, how it relates to technology, how it relates to everything, then these are a few different links that you can grab. And just based on titles, you can pretty much figure out which one is which. <laughs> and the fun thing is that Stanford actually made a TED Talk about design thinking your life, yeah. which is actually kind of a good one. Interesting. You can Google it. <laughs> And then these are some different lesson plans and projects. So the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, they put together a whole bunch of pre-made lesson plans as you're getting used to design thinking and you want to test it out. Uh, my favorite one on there is there is one that you can make like a little drone out of paper. Really? And you have to like, they put these little um, templates on there that you can cut out. And then okay. you have to figure out how wide to make the template and how long to make the template so that it takes longer to drop and fall to the ground. And then you can, that's kind of showing people how to tweak their design and figure out wh like mm. how to design something so that it does what you want it to do. And then there are others that kind of dive more into thinking about people first and thinking about your audience first. There's also a little mini website on there too. <laughs> and that's more cool. for people that are just learning um, HTML. Mm -hmm. And HTML is that markup language, which would be just the way the text and stuff appears on your screen. And then Stanford developed the school that they call the D school that kind of gives about a million and one different things about design thinking. Um, they keep reformatting it every year, so if you look at it a year or two from now, it'll probably look different again. <laughs> because they design things, they're design that's, thinking. Hey, that's good. I know. <laughs> and then they're using their own, taking their own advice. It's true. Yeah, they need to true. do that. <laughs> and then common sense education, they they go through design thinking in a different categories and through different subject categories. And PBS News, they have pretty similar to common sense education. Mm, more resources, yeah. yeah. But this one, I'm going to close the pop-up that just, there. So this one go kind of runs the gamut as to the different topics. Um, I opened this one because of the Power of Invention series that they have. Mm. And this kind of shows what technology can actually mean to people. And, oh, biomimicry is also kind of helpful in robotics, mm -hmm. just because a lot of robots are inspired by animals. There's a brachiating robot that kind of looks like a snake. Mm -hmm. But it is 11.03, so mm -hmm. do we have any questions about design thinking? Let's see. So, yeah, if you have any questions, anything you want to know more about, type into the question section. We'll answer them here. 
Um, go as long as you guys have any questions. Nobody had anything throughout the show. That's okay. Um, as I said, the resources will be available to you. The slides will be with all these links to everything here. So you definitely have a lot to explore yeah, uh, for when you do to start using this in your own libraries. Yeah. And it can be used in a lot of different contexts. Oh yeah, that's what I that's what I, like. I think I like about it is that it's. I mean, the title of this particular show is Design Thinking: How Technology Is Made, but it's actually more than that. It's a yeah. it's a process you can use to do lots of things, yeah. and and I think it's a process we use unconsciously sometimes. Don't oh, really not. say to ourselves, yeah. "I need to do design thinking to figure this out." You just start doing it. Yeah. Um, some of these steps of, all right, why am I doing that? Who is it for? What do I need it to look like? And you don't realize you're doing these yeah. things already, but now here it is kind of laid out as a, here's the, you know, here's the process of what you've been doing, yeah. or maybe you didn't realize the process you're using for one thing can be applied to other stuff you need to do. Thanksgiving dinner? Yeah, Thanksgiving dinner, yes. Who's going to be going? Who's How many coming? people are going to be there? How much food do I need to make? Do mm -hmm. I want to have leftovers? Do you said like, do people have allergies? Yeah. Do so certain dishes have to be there? Yeah. Uh, will people bring something of their own? Yeah. Do yeah. I have a mother-in-law that's finicky and wants a specific <laughs> table setting? <laughs> <laughs> you know? Do I have enough table settings? Do I have yeah. enough plates and chairs and seats and look at that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking of all these things. Yeah. Yeah. How is it all going to fit in the oven? Uh, do I just want a nap? Is it not? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so think about this. For I know by now some of this might be too late for you. Yeah. But if you're doing things for other holiday events, I know some people have multiple Thanksgivings. Yeah. Um, this beyond tomorrow. I know I have at least two more after tomorrow yeah. <laughs> that I know of. Um, plus other holiday uh, get-togethers that people have too. Yeah. Same kind of thing. Something to think about. Yeah. I also did it with um, making lasagna and buying ingredients. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. How so much do you need? Which do? lasagna do you want to use? Where do you want to find the recipe? How do you, if you're already at work, how do you find out if you have the ingredients at home or not? Uh, yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> I made like a little decision tree. It was a thing. <laughs> yeah. Practice it on simple things like that that you yeah. do all the time, then yeah, it becomes habit. It's true. Yeah. yeah. All right, well, it doesn't look like anybody had any urgent questions they're going to ask right now. That's fine. Um, you can always call Amanda and chat with her about this if you want to, or email or whatever. Um, and all of these resources will be available online. So, so do you have any other last slides to show, or was that the, no, the end of it? Okay. The resources. It. Okay. All right, then I think we will uh, wrap it up officially for today. And let's see, where are we at here? Let's get to, go ahead and type in Encompass Live. Um, we're going to get to our uh, Encompass Live website so far on the Internet. Yay. When you type in, use your search engine of choice, Encompass Live is the only thing that comes up that's called that. Nobody else is allowed to just call themselves this. <laughs> um, so this is our main page, and um, as I said, the show is being recorded, and these are upcoming shows for the next couple of months, but right underneath here is a link to get to our archive. Most recent one at the top of the list here, so um, that's from last week's show. This week's will appear here by the end of the day today. I'm going to have it done before I leave. Um, and we'll have a link to the recording, which will be on our YouTube channel, and a link to the presentation, which is um, Amanda's Google uh, slides there, which will have the links for all those resources in there. Uh, when it is ready, I will email everyone who attended today and everyone who registered for today's show to let you know that it's there and ready um, to be viewed, so keep an eye on that. And then we'll push out on our various um, uh, social media platforms and mailing lists as well. We have Twitter and um, the Library Commission, or not the Library Commission, and Compass Live also has a Facebook page. Um, and while we're here on the archives, I will show you, we do have a search feature here to search our archives. You can search all of them or just most recent 12 months. Um, why is that? Because Encompass Live has been around for about 10 years. Our first year was in January, two, our first show was in January 2009. And we have all of our archives here. If I scroll all the way down, we go all the way back to 2009. So uh, you can just limit to current shows, recent shows if you want to when you're doing a search or just search the full, the full archive. Uh, just pay attention to the date when something was originally broadcast. Um, they're all dated on the original, they all have the original broadcast date on there. Uh, many things will still be good, useful information, but some things may become dated. Uh, websites might not exist anymore. Services may have changed. 
um, links might be not working. So just pay attention when you're looking at some of our older uh, archives there. Um, but we are librarians. We archive and save things. And as long as we have somewhere to host all these recordings, they will always be out there and available to you. Uh, back to our main page. That's where their archive will be. Our Facebook page is over here. And I post here. There's a reminder to join to sign up for today's show. Um, so if you are a big Facebook user, give us a like over there. You get notified eh, two or three times a week about things we're doing on the show. When the, no, I don't want to log in right now. Thank you. Um, when our new show is our next show is coming up, when archives or um, recordings are available, anything going on, so um, you can keep an eye on what's going on on uh, Encompass Live over there if you like. So that will be um, for today's show. Next week, our topic is libraries and the LGBT plus experience. Um, this is uh, talking about the your LG. Uh, BT community, anyone um, doing programs, resources, training. We've got two librarians, Tina Dalton and Jennifer Stickles, who are from um, two different libraries in um, New York, my home state, actually. Uh, they are small rural libraries, actually. This is a presentation that was originally done at the ARSL conference earlier this, this fall, Association for Rural and Small Libraries. So they are both in very small communities, and they are doing some programming for their um, LGBT uh, communities. So um, we'll talk to them about that last week. They will not be coming here. They'll be coming in remotely <laughs> as presenters. Um, but please do sign up for that show and anything else you see on our calendar here. We have our December all booked, and we're getting some January dates up. Um, sometime soon, we'll know what uh, Amanda's going to be talking about in her December pre sweet tech. I don't know. You might already have an chat idea. Box. Chat box? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, you can see here she is um, generally at the end of the month, but because of calendar thing dates and whatnot, as you can see here, I've mentioned December 24th, we have special notifications on these particular ones. Christmas Day, um, the 25th is a Wednesday, usually with a show on a Wednesday. We, as a state agency, are closed on the holiday, so this pretty sweet tech is bumped to actually Tuesday. Uh, the 24th. And the same thing for the end of the month. We're doing our summer reading program session with Sally Snyder, our Children's and Youth Services Librarian. Also, January 1st is when this, would, this week's show would normally be, but we're also closed on New Year's Day, so hers also bumped back to December 31st. So we have little notifications about that. So just do pay attention to when the dates are when things sometimes need to be changed. Um, so that will wrap up for today's, today's show. Thank you everyone for attending. Hopefully we'll see you on another Encompass Live in the future. And have a good Thanksgiving holiday tomorrow. Um, be safe um, and have um, a happy holiday. That's where you are, you know, hopefully doing something with your family, friends and family. All right. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs>